So we are in chapter 14. We got through chapter 13 last week. I'm going to shoot for getting through the first 25 verses. I'm starting to question that already, looking at the clock. Like, I don't know. But we'll see how far we get. Paul is going to kind of lean into some things. But before we get there, as we get into chapter 14, if you know how many chapters there are, there's 16. And so we're kind of getting close to the home stretch. I mean, we started this last October, and we're coming into a year's anniversary in this book, and we're kind of getting there to the last couple chapters, so that's kind of exciting. But Paul is going to continue tonight in chapter 14 to address things that he brought up in chapter 12. And in that first verse in chapter 12, says, Now concerning spiritual gifts. And in the Greek, it doesn't have gifts. In your Bible, it might be in italics. Because that's added on. It actually in the Greek just says concerning spirituals or spiritual things. But gifts is added because for the rest of that chapter in chapter 14, he's specifically talking to gifts. He gives us a list in 12 of those gifts. We went over that list and he, we kind of explained what the different gifts are in the church and the ones he listed, what they mean for us today. And then he urges him to have unity in those gifts. He goes on to compare the church to this body, this human body, and how every part is important. Every part, whether it's seen or not seen, covered or out in the open, seems super useful, wonder what it does. It's all incredibly important to the body of Christ. The gifts that you have are needed in the church today, every one of them. That God has blessed this church with. And so he kind of leans into that, that no one gift is more important than another. But then after speaking about the gifts and the different gifts and the unity we're to have in them, he gives us those words, but there, there's one more thing that, that really is key to the whole thing, right? And he goes into chapter 13 and tells us about love. That we can have all the gifts in the world, but without love, we're a clanging gong and a crashing cymbal. That, that if we don't do it in love, in a godly, agape love, it really brings nothing. It bears no eternal fruit. And so Paul is speaking through all of that. And as he moves on from that idea of love and describing how love is shown through our behaviors, through our actions, not just, oh, a warm, fuzzy, emotional, I love you, right? But it's acted on and acted out. And he tells us in the last chapter 13 what that looks like and describes it. He jumps into 14. And in 14 tonight, he gets back to this idea of spirituals or spiritual gifts. And he's going to lean into two and kind of two and a half But really just two. He's going to lean it back into tongues. And because it's a part of tongues, interpretation. And he's going to lean back in prophecy. And more specifically, he's going to lean into the idea of the proper use of tongues and prophecy in the gathering of the church. And so that's where we're going to be tonight. Now, it's safe to assume as we get to this chapter that Paul's addressing it because it's a problem in the church. He doesn't address any of the other gifts on the list as directly as he does these two. And so it seems to be that these two gifts in the church are being abused, are being misused. And so he's going to address these two gifts explaining the correct use of tongues and interpretation, and again, the gift of prophecy, how they relate to one another, how one is more preferable than the other. So that's pretty much what chapter 14 boils down to. We're not going to finish it. It's a longer chapter, but I do want to get quite a ways through it. So we'll see how far we get. 1 Corinthians 14.1. If you have your Bibles, go there. Um, I think Al got it all loaded on the app tonight, and so there's a lot. She said it was a record for me of verses I'm going to use. I don't know if that's actually true. She kind of exaggerates sometimes, but it, it might be. It's a lot of verses, so if you have the app, uh, open up that app, and you can follow along there or get really good at sword drills. 1 Corinthians 14.1, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. 
Right out of the gate, remember he's coming out of chapter 13. He's coming out of expressing what love is and how important love is. And he says, pursue love. That word pursue, we kind of think, okay, pursue it. Kind of try for it. And that's not what that word means in the Greek. It means chase after, run it down, aggressively seek it in haste. Not like I'll get there when I get there. When I have time, in haste, earnestly desire to take over or overtake it. When I thought of that idea of earnestly desiring to overtake it, it brought this image into my mind. Being an engineer, everything happens up here in pictures. It's just the way my mind works. But if you're into baseball at all and you watch baseball, you've maybe seen the Atlanta Braves dude, kind of when they take a break between innings, the freeze that races other people. Anybody seen that dude in Atlanta? Like, seriously, you guys have not seen the freeze? How could you not? I don't even like baseball, and I've seen this dude like 20 times. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. When they take a break between innings, they're going to have a longer break, right? This dude uh, called the Freeze, and his real name is Duran Dunn. He's a Jamaican sprinter. He's a runner. So he's already fast, and he gets in a thing that looks like the like cartoon dude, Mr. Freeze. You know that dude from, you know, that guy. He kind of looks like that guy. Got the slick costume and everything going on. And they choose a random guy out of the fans that are there that night to race him. And kind of depending on who they are, but they give them a head start. And I've seen them give them almost, they run from outfield in the left side all the way around the outside to the right field side. And so from line to line, they run all the way around that dirt track. And I've seen them start them halfway around that track, and this dude, the freeze, just takes off at the gun and pursues them with haste. I mean, he's just booking as fast as he can go and overtakes them almost every time before they get to the finish line. Ivan, and I'm saving this for a sermon later, saw one dude who was going to finally beat him, and I'm like, this dude's got him. And he's like 10 feet from the line, and he eats it in the dirt. I'm thinking, talk about a perfect example of crashing at the finish line, like tripped right at the finish line. He was there, and the freeze dude ran across and just goes, yeah, that's right, I got you, right? And I'm like, the guy's dusting himself off, pursuing with haste. If you can get that image in your mind, that guy runs as fast as he can to catch that guy that's got this massive head start. And he does it almost every time. He gives it everything that he's got. We're to pursue love. We're to pursue loving God, and we're to pursue loving others. And if you need to, look up the freeze. You'll see him run. You'll get the idea. Clearly, all of you don't watch enough baseball. No, no, I just cool that he ran. So, but maybe, maybe. It's because I'm a runner. That's what Margaret said. It, it could be. It caught my eye for sure. And I thought I couldn't outrun that dude. I did think that. 1 Corinthians 14, a pursue love, and then it says this, and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Not either or. You're to desire and pursue things of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, kindness. We're, we have those. We're, we're to grow in those, but we're also, and pursue love, again, a fruit of the Spirit, and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, the things that the Holy Spirit gives you to use for his glory that works in you and through you to build his kingdom. It's both. We're to pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. So it's okay to ask. If you don't have a gift, ask, pursue Desire, but we talked about it before. He's going to give you what, he, what you need. It's, it's the best gift. is the one that you can use in the moment in your life. But then it goes on and says, especially that you may prophesy. We talked about the gift of prophecy a few weeks ago, and Paul is going to elaborate it on it here. 
But that idea of prophecy is speaking the mind of God, the will of God, the word of God. Sometimes it's, it's something that's going to happen in the future, as you see so often in the Old Testament. They prophesy of, of different judgments that are going to come against the people and different things. Sometimes prophecy is just speaking the word of God, sharing the word and the truth of God. So we talked about that. He's going to elaborate on why prophecy is to be desired, desired specifically. He's going to say why it's more preferable than the gift of tongues. And so we'll just keep going. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. The gift of tongues that Paul seems to be leaning to here isn't the same gift. And in fact... When you read through scripture and it speaks to tongues, one of the only places you see that it's foreign languages and is Acts 2 at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit falls on them and they all heard it in their own language. Often it's more of an angelic tongue, which is what he's leaning to here. It's an angelic tongue because he makes it clear. One who prophet or understands him who I'm sorry. Who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Right? So it's not a tongue where I'm speaking, and by the way, I don't know Spanish. Suddenly I'm speaking Spanish to somebody that comes in and is a Spanish speaker. That would be awesome. But this is a language that's used towards God. An angelic tongue, which is implied throughout Scripture to be used mostly in prayer. Because you speak not to men but to God. And again, we looked at this idea of an angelic tongue earlier. But, you know, we spoke to this, because this goes on. Even those that speak in an angelic tongue, to my knowledge, don't understand what they're saying. That's my experience, and that's what this says. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. I've talked to many people, and I'll get to this, speak to this a little more later, but that has that gift of an angelic tongue, and they get impressions of what it means. Well, I feel like this gives me strength in this situation. I feel like this does this. But they don't know what the words specifically mean. And it says here, for no one understands. It goes on in verse 3, on the other hand, so now you've got the tongues, and it's, it's a language being lifted up, to God that nobody understands because they're uttering the mysteries. But now he compares it to, puts it alongside prophecies. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. So he's comparing this gift of tongues and an angelic tongue specifically, speaking to God, almost a prayer language going on to prophecy that speaks to the body, that people understand, that there, it says specifically that in this verse that it's for the upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation of the body. So, in contrast to speaking in a tongue, which... Even the person saying it doesn't usually understand without the gift of interpretation, which they could have both, which he'll speak to in a minute. The one who prophesies is speaking on behalf of the Lord to strengthen others, encourage others, comfort others with words, again, that they understand. So when someone speaks prophecy, the word and the will of God to you, it's to build you up. It's going to stir you up. It's going to motivate you. It's going to comfort you. It's going to encourage you. Again, Paul's word, it's upbuilding, encouraging, and it consoles. Verse 4, and he's going to, I'm going to kind of go through these because they all tie together, and he's getting to a point. 1 Corinthians 14, 4, the one who speaks in a tongue, now he's back to the tongue, builds up himself. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. When you speak in a tongue, it's a very edifying experience. Again, I've spoken with people that have this gift. And and when I've asked them about it, each one of them says basically the same thing. They feel it strengthens them. It encourages them. They use the word. It builds them up. It empowers them. They feel closer to God 
when they're speaking in an angelic tongue. They all basically have told me the same thing when I talk to them. Now, it's clear, I don't have this gift. I actually prayed for it for almost an hour once. God's like, yeah, I would have given it to you like 59 minutes ago if I wanted you to have it. But I kept ask, seek, knock, right? I was like, come on. But in regards to the tongues, they feel this closeness to God, but that's as far as it goes. Notice what it says. They build themselves up. And the people I've talked to said, yeah, it strengthens me. It encourages me. I feel closer to God. I feel empowered. It's a very personal thing. So it's a beautiful thing. I'm not demeaning that gift at all. It's a very beautiful, strength and empowering gift. But he's contrasting it and he's speaking to the gathering of the body. And so with this gift of tongues, it, they build themselves up, but it's as far as it goes. It doesn't do the same for the people that hear it around unless there is somebody there with a gift of interpretation. But prophecy builds up the church. And can I clear up one more thing I think I was confused for by for a while? And I want to make sure we understand this. Some people believe that prophecy within, or I'm sorry, tongues with interpretation leads to prophecy. Nowhere in Scripture does that ever happen. In Scripture, tongues are spoken out almost in a worshipful thing. Again, I'm talking angelic tongues, right? You can prophesy in Spanish if that's not your language. In an angelic tongue, it's never interpreted into prophecy. Again, it builds up the person doing it, which is why Paul's making this contrast here. And so tongues, even with interpretation, doesn't in the Bible come out to equal prophecy. There's no example of that there. 1 Corinthians 14, 5. Now I want you all to speak in tongues. Again, Paul's like, and I want you all to do it. It's so encouraging. It's upbuilding. It's comforting. It works inside. It's just, it's an awesome, empowering thing to ministers to your spirit and your soul. I want you all to speak in tongues. Oh, but even more in prophecy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Again, keep it in the context. He's addressing a problem going on in the gathering of the church. Man, I love it. I wish you all could speak in that language and just feel that closeness to the Lord through that gifting. But boy, even more so, I wish you all prophesied. So, to speak prophecy, the word and the will of God, in a way that can be understood when we're gathered together is greater and more useful for the church when we're gathered together. Then someone who speaks in a tongue, because the whole goal, and you, the whole point Paul is trying to make is when we are gathered together, it's to grow, to build each other up, to encourage each other, to equip each other and be equipped. It's the point of the gathering together. Speaking a language where nobody else around you understands isn't beneficial to the body as a whole. There is no advantage to that. And so if you speak a tongue in a public gathering, there must be an interpreter. In fact, there has to be someone to interpret according to verse 28. And we're going to get to this a bit later. 1 Corinthians 14, 28. But if there is no one to interpret, Paul says, let each of them keep silent in the church. And speak to himself and God. Like if there's not an interpreter, that needs to be between you and the Lord. Keep silent. Again, the gathering together. And he's going to speak to this again more later. 1 Corinthians 14, 6, 8. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring some revelation? And many people believe that word revelation is a gift of wisdom. So unless... Uh, I bring some wisdom or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. Bring something that the body can glean from, can grow from, but can be equipped by. And then he says this, If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, 
How will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? Again, it seems that Paul is addressing the problem in the gathering of the Corinthian church, that everybody wanted to speak what was on their heart, and everybody wanted to use their gifting and display it in front of everybody else. And I have the gift of tongues, so I'm just going to launch into the gift of tongues. And I have the gift of prophecy. Let me just prophesy from over in this corner. And everybody was doing their own thing, whether it was teaching, prophesying, tongues, wisdom, knowledge. It was just coming out in the gathering. And Paul is making the argument, That when we're gathered together, things are to be done in an orderly way. The things that are said, the things that are done, the things that are sung should all be things that we can understand and grow from and through, be equipped by, not chaotic. And to make his point, he gives us two examples in these verses. One's a music-based example and one's a military one. The first one, the musical one, imagine... Somebody like Jean comes up like he did tonight, and he starts putting some strings, some chords together, because he's got that gifting. And he knows how to put those chords together and those notes together. And tonight, boy, the minute he gets started, you're like, oh, I know this song. And you can just close your eyes and hear the music and be led to the feet of Jesus and worship Jesus in the song. Because there's harmony there. We can all come together. It's a beautiful thing. But if somebody comes up and starts plucking at a guitar randomly, groups of strings hit together, it's not very pleasant. I remember when my kids were little, I'd play a guitar a little bit, and I would play my guitar, and my little young ones at the time would want to play along, and they would bang on those strings. and Just, oh, sounded terrible. I mean, it was cute. We got videos. Look, they're singing and playing. But come on, let's be real. It sounded awful. Right? There was no harmony there. There was, it just, it didn't go, oh, praise the Lord. Right? Whole different thing. Because they weren't strung together. They were chaotic. When the notes are played the way they're meant to be played, as we saw tonight, they comfort us, they stir us up, they draw us closer to the Lord, they unify us in song. We're not all singing different songs. Now I know, for me personally, sometimes I take a key a little farther than it should go. A little higher, a little lower, that's okay. We're moving in the same direction. So if you're in the same boat I am, you're in good company. It's all good. But we're all singing the same song, worshiping the Lord together. In harmony, in unity. When it's done right, it leads us to worship the Lord together. Then he uses this military example, and it's the same idea. In the early days of the church, and and even in the military today, in some cases, when somebody blew a trumpet, it meant to do something. There was a certain string of sounds, and it, it means something. It means move in that direction. It means something. In fact, I'll give you an example. Na, 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 na. Come on. We all know what that means. It's just like a few notes. It's six notes strung together. But if we heard that on the trumpet, we're like, yes. Again, back to baseball. Clearly, you're not a bunch of baseball fans. But I hope you've heard that at the game, right? Or at the football game. It's like, now it's time. Let's get them. We know what that means. But if you play a bunch of random notes, nobody knows what to do. Do you charge? Do you retreat? Do you run for the mess hall because it's 10 minutes till they shut it down? What does that mean? You don't know. It's chaotic. It's not helpful. It's not useful. That's the point Paul is making here. Random notes don't further the mission of the church. They don't bring us together with purpose. They don't bring us together in unity. 1 Corinthians 14, 9, so with yourselves, now he's speaking to them, so with yourselves, if, you're t- if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? He's again making his point. If you just start jumping out with these things that nobody understands, 
how is anybody even going to know what you said? For you will be speaking into the air. You'll be speaking words that nobody understands. It's not going to lead to somebody being ministered to, edified, built up, or encouraged. He said, you're just speaking into the air. I've said this myself. Maybe you've said this. If you have kids and you've told them to do something six or seven or eight times, have you ever said, I feel like I'm speaking to the wall? Because they're not hearing it. They're not understanding it. You can repeat it. They're not getting it. For you will be speaking to the air. So with yourself, when we are gathered together, if with your tongue you utter speech that is in, unintell, or not intelligible, how will anybody know what is said? You're speaking. Just, it's just going up into nothing. 1 Corinthians 14, 10 and 11. There are doubtless many different languages in the world and none without meaning. How many of us know there are, and I was going to look it up, but I don't know how many, if anybody knows, hundreds if not thousands of languages on this planet. And we talked about this earlier, that a language is simply an agreement that certain words and simple sounds, certain sounds strung together mean something. I can say tree, and we all think of a tree. I can say flower. I can say building. Right? That's just an agreement. If I go to another company, they're like building. I don't know what that even means because they don't understand English. Right? So there's many different languages in the world and none of them without meaning. They all have purpose to the ones that are hearing it. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. We're not communicating. We're not connecting in that. And we become literally a foreigner in their presence. If you don't know the language, they don't know the language, you're both not there. People who don't understand each other's language really have a tough time communicating with each other. Have you ever been in a foreign country where they spoke a completely different language than you? I haven't. I watched Amazing Race. And I've seen them struggle in a foreign country trying to figure out where something is because they're like, just here. And they're like, I don't speak it. And they pull out the Google Translate. And like, But I have been in a home where they all speak a different language than me. And I didn't understand a word that was being said in that home. It was family and we were gathered together. And I'm like, odd man out. And I'm like, I have no clue what anybody's saying in this house. They were all speaking Spanish. And I felt totally out of place. Totally isolated. I had no idea what people were talking about. And I got to tell you, it was a little discouraging. I felt like I didn't belong. Fortunately, my mother-in-law could translate it for me and give me some of the words that were there. And as long as she was translating, I could kind of tag along. But even tagging along, I didn't feel fully engaged and trying to participate. Can you tell them this? And there was still a disconnect there. I started to communicate, but it was still a struggle. And the minute they started translating, I was right back to being lost. That's exactly, hear this, that is the, exactly the opposite experience you should be having when we gather together as the church. You shouldn't feel like a foreigner in a strange place. We should be coming together in unity in our worship services. God intends us to be united, not divided, not separated. Specifically in the case, this case, speaking of an unknown language to each other without an interpretation, specifically in tongues, he never meant for that to happen in the church. When we're gathered together, we encourage each other, we equip each other, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't mean somebody doesn't walk in here and like, oh, you speak Spanish. I, that's a different thing than we're talking here. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, they're seeking after spiritual gifts. They're desiring them, but even inordinately because they were puffing each other up in them. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the, of the Spirit. And then he says this, strive to excel in building up the church. Is that our goal when it comes to spiritual gifts? 
Do you desire certain spiritual gifts so that you could have it? Right? I'd love to have the musical gift. I'd love to pick up a guitar like my son Corey does. He can play a piano just by hearing something. And I'm like, dude, that is a gift. Like, that's crazy. My daughter's very similar when it comes to singing. She can just belt it out. Jen's heard it. Abigail can, like, sing a song, hear it on the radio, and just hit every note. She, it's just, like, crazy. I'd love to have that gift, but I got to tell you, part of me just wants to have that gift because I want to do it. I don't care if you're built up by it. I think it'd be cool, right? That's the wrong attitude. When we desire a spiritual gift, it should be to strive to excel in the building up of the church. So when it comes to your spiritual gifts, whatever they might are, and I'll ask you, whatever your gift is, do you strive to build up the church using that gift? Do you strive to see the church edified, built up, the kingdom built up through your gift? And I will even add that word that Paul adds, even more so. Don't just strive. Strive to excel in that gift, which means to be exceptionally good at building up the church. Not just, yeah, I'm going to have a ministry at the church, and I'm going to use my gift in that ministry. He says, strive to excel in building gifts really good using your gift to reach people for Jesus Christ. If you want a spiritual gift, if you have a spiritual gift, and you all do, strive to excel in glorifying God in that gift. 1 Corinthians 14, 13, therefore. So now he's been talking about this idea of tongues and prophecy and the differences between the two. And one's a beautiful thing, but really more between you and God. And one is for the building up and equipping of the church. He says, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. How cool would it be if you had both? So you didn't have to look for somebody with the gift of interpretation. You just show up. And if you feel like you're given something by God through tongues and you lift it up, you can interpret it right then and there. Some of you are doubting that already because this gift has been used and abused so often. But it is a gift. It's a beautiful gift. So if you have been given the gift of tongues, pray also for the gift of interpretation so that not only would you know what you're saying, but the ones around you would know as well. And now Paul switches from third person, or he said just now, therefore, One who speaks, talking about others, to I. And at this point, he transitions to talking about himself. And he says in 14, 14, for if I pray in a tongue. It says, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. We talked about that before. His spirit is lifting up these words to God. He's in this prayer language to God, but his mind isn't understanding what he's saying. It's unfruitful to him. I know I'm saying words. I'm praying them, but I don't understand them. My spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. And again, we we went into that earlier, so I won't go into it too much. But he adds a bit more detail as he goes on here. If my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful, he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, then what am I to do? I think that's a fair question. What am I to do? He goes on. I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Paul is saying, I've got the gift of tongues. Man, I I am going to lift up my prayer to God in tongues in my devotional time. When I have that time with the Lord, I'm going to use that gift. I'm going to be encouraged in that gift, strengthened in that gift. Man, I'm going to glorify God in that gift, and I'm also going to use it in my mind. I'm going to go out and I'm going to pray with my spirit, but I'm also going to pray in my mind, praying with words I understand, lifting up my concerns, you know, acts. Right? If you don't, it's kind of an easy way to follow in prayer. You give God accolades, A. You confess, which is the C. Right? A, C, T. You give thanksgiving and then supplication. It's like lifting up God. It kind of follows the Lord's prayer where you lift him up. Hallowed be his name. 
His kingdom come, his will be done. Lord, if there's any sin in me, show me, confess it, get it out. God, thank you so much for whatever he's done for you. And after those three things, boy, here's what I need. That's praying with your mind. Right? He says he does both. And I will sing praise with my I will sing praise with my spirit, but also sing with my mind. He's gonna sing in both. I'll pray with my spirit when I'm alone with God, but in my mind also, and when I'm gathered with the church, and vice versa. Paul wants us to worship God in spirit and in our minds through prayer and through singing. Doing both. I would just ask the simple question tonight, do you pray? It doesn't have to be in tongues. If you have the gift of tongues, you can pray in the Spirit. You can lift that up, letting the Holy Spirit lead. But do you pray? I think so often too many of us fall short in our prayer life. It's easy to put it off until tomorrow. Jen and I have pray every morning together that we can, but there's some mornings we look back and we go, we totally got busy yesterday and didn't pray together. Life gets in the way. What does your prayer life look like? And I'll take it one step farther. I'll ask you another question. This one might be more challenging to some of you. When you worship the Lord in song, when we come together, do you sing along, praising God as John was up here, truly praising him, worshiping him in the songs? Or like some, are you sitting just hoping the song will end because you don't feel your voice is good enough and you don't really like singing, it's not your thing. And so you just wait for our worship time in song to pass by. Every week, straight up truth bomb, I'm surprised every Sunday morning when I come up to do announcements and the sanctuary is like halfway full. And then when you come up later, it's like, wow, where did these other hundred people come from? And you know what that says to me as a pastor? People don't understand what worship through song is all about. Because if they did, they wouldn't just so easily miss it. It wouldn't be okay to be, it's just the singing part. That's not my thing anyway. We're to lift God up in song, praising his name. Singing when we gather isn't just for those who like singing. It's a way to worship the Lord. And can I give you a heads up? It's not going to stop when we get to heaven, so you better figure it out now. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Psalm 101 and 2, make a joyful noise to the Lord. That's where I fit in. All the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. If you're not a singer, that's okay. God knows. You're not surprising him like, ooh, didn't hear that note coming. He knows. Before you were born, he knew you were going to hit that weird note. It's okay. We praise him through singing. What does your prayer life look like? How much do you value our time worshiping in song together? Paul says we need to pray spiritually and we need to pray in our minds. We need to sing Worship to God spiritually and sing worship to God with our minds, knowing what we're saying and praising him on purpose. Okay, sidebar, back to our verses. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, what are we to do? Both, if you have that gift of tongues. Again, pray in the spirit, pray in your mind, sing praise in your spirit, sing praise in your mind also. It's not a this or that, it is a this and that, Paul says. But you need to do it appropriately. 1 Corinthians 14, 16, and 17. Oh, gosh, we're not even getting close. Okay. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in your position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. It's pretty clear he's reiterating what he said. If the person next to you is 
praising God in tongues, and you're like, amen, wait, what did you say? How can you come alongside in agreement if you're not sure what they're saying? You're not worshiping together in the gathering. You can only agree with something that you understand. Verses 18 and 19. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, again, see what he's doing there. He speaks tongues more than all of them. So clearly he's got a devotional life. There's a time when he's not gathered with the body that he is clearly using tongues, lifting up, singing. Nevertheless, in church, when we're gathered together, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Paul spoke in tongues more than all of them, but it's clear that in his life, when he did, it wasn't in the gathering of the church. It was in his private devotional time while he was praying and praising God. Now, it's okay to do it in the gathering of the church. If there's an interpreter, and it's going to speak to that in some upcoming verses on what that looks like. It's okay. But where you see the greatest use of that gift is is your private devotional life. Nevertheless, in church, I'd rather speak five words than 10,000 words in a tongue. That word 10,000, when they heard Paul say that, they understood kind of when we say, man... There's like a gazillion of those, right? It's just an exaggerated term to mean a whole lot. Paul would rather speak just a few words that ministered to people, equipped people, built people up, than 10,000 words in a gathering that really didn't help anybody. We're going to continue on. That's, it's actually past 730. I'm totally blown away that I did not finish. Um, Because I have a lot more. So if you want to stay for another half hour, we can finish this out. But um, we're going to stop there. We're going to pick up 1 Corinthians 14, 20 and 25. And this, so far, and I'll just give you a preview. It's been pretty clear if you understand what Paul is trying to say up to this point. Right? If you just kind of go through it and follow it a little bit, give it some thought. I think for the most part... There was no big mystery there. It's about the gathering of the body and the equipping of the body. They're both great, but they both have their place. Now he's going to say some things in the next five or six verses that actually is kind of confusing because they seem to contradict each other. So if you want to know the answer, come back next week, and I will go through those next verses and explain to you exactly why that's weird and what that means. So... Uh, Let me pray us out. Father, we thank you for this word. I pray, Father, that you minister to us through this word in us and through us, Father. That we have a better understanding of what we learned tonight. And again, that that we apply it to our lives. That we have this understanding that when we gather together, even earnestly seeking your gifts, our desire to be to excel in glorifying you, excel in building your kingdom, excel in serving you in all the gifts and through all the gifts you've given us. I thank you that every person sitting here has giftings, that you've purposed good works for each person here to do. Give us the strength, the courage, and the opportunities to walk in them. And Father, bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight.